Fought as Fiharoif, could he fail a literary her Kirkagwina, for Sulagum Gravuni Canavas. I would like to welcome you all tonight um, for this wonderful event. Um, it's a real treat for everybody. Um, we're broadcasting to an absolutely packed house, or many houses, should I say, to be more accurate. I'd like to thank you all so much for being with us. Um, I would especially like to thank the people who have made the festival this year happen. Um, that is Mwinter Kirkagwina, the people of the peninsula have been wonderful to us. Our founders, our sponsors, the grant organizations that have, have offered us wonderful support. Um, thank you all very much. It's because of you that, that we're here and the weekend has been such a success. Um, it has been a strange year and unfortunately we can't all be together. It was such a beautiful sunny day in Dingle today. I'm looking out from Dingle Hub at the harbour and it's glorious and it would be so lovely if you were all here. But Hopefully next year things will be things will be different. Um, this evening I'm absolutely absolutely awed uh, with the two guests that we have, um, two extremely powerful and very important writers of our time, Britt Bennett and Emma Debiri. And I would like to thank them so much for graciously accepting our invitation to come to Dingle Lit. I'd like to give you a little bit of background. Um, on both of, uh, of these influential writers. Uh, Brish Bennett is an American writer and her debut novel, The Mothers, was published in 2016 and it was a New York Times bestseller. Brit's second book, The Vanishing Half, reached the number one spot um, on the New York Times bestseller list in June. Um, the Vanishing Half, it belongs to a long tradition of literature about racial passing, how countless black Americans cross the color line to pass as white, for various reasons, to escape slavery or threats of racial violence, or to gain access to the social, political, and economic benefits conferred by whiteness. The narrative of passing inevitably confronts the dissonance between the authentic self and the projected self. The drama of seeing and being seen, all of Bennett's characters in The Vanishing Half wrestle with the roles they have been assigned. Uh, interesting questions arise, is identity something you take on or something you take apart? Is it something you erect or expose? Brit is a very natural storyteller. Um, you can almost hear the slow drawl of the Louisiana accents as, as she takes us through, um, through the 40 years over which this book is based. Um, the Washington Post described The Vanishing Half very aptly as a fierce examination of contemporary passing and the price so many pay for a new identity. Emma Dabiri is an Irish Nigerian author. She's an academic and a broadcaster. She published many, many articles and many papers in, in many academic journals and in the press, including The Guardian, The Irish Times. Um, she's broadcast on the BBC. Her debut book, uh, Don't Touch My Hair, was first published in 2019. In her book, Emma combines memoir with social commentary and philosophy. Uh, while Don't Touch My Hair is her first foray into book writing, um, it's 
it complements her experience of Afro hair with research and context pulled in from her academic studies. Um, British, or Emma is at the moment doing a PhD. Um, the book, it's a groundbreaking book and in it, Emma's voice is very strong with a very vivid sense of purpose. Emma herself, she, she's burning a pathway. She does not shy away from the hard topics, nor will she allow us to. After the death of uh, George Floyd, Emma shared a resource on Instagram called What White People Can Do Next and was overwhelmed by outpourings of enthusiasm, relief from white people deeply affected by racial justice protests that were unfolding across the world, but unsure what to do next. Her new book, in, which is coming out in March, deals with this topic. Um, and no doubt we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you both, two powerhouse writers to the Dingle Literary Festival. We're absolutely honored to have you here. And now I'm gonna hand over to Emma, who's going to um, take the conversation from here. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, welcome, Britt. Really looking forward to, to this session. I think of the many events that I haven't been able to do in person over this last year. This is one of the ones that I'm most gutted about. I would so love to be in Dingle, such a beautiful part of the world. And I would particularly love to be there with you getting into <laughs> it, <laughs> IRL. But uh, this will suffice. So welcome. Thank you. Thanks for doing this with me. No, my, my, my pleasure. Um, so we've only got like, we've only got 20 minutes in conversation before we open out to um, the audience. So I will just, I'll just get right into it. Um, what are your levels of Zoom fatigue at this, at this stage? <laughs> <laughs> I think as bad as, as everyone's. Um, I, I pretty much live on Zoom these days. <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. And sometimes I'm just like, I don't think I can bear another moment of it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so yeah, I want so much I wanted to ask you about. The first thing I wanted to say was like, I was amazed um, when I, okay, so there's, by how, by how young you are in that the book has a sense of, like, do people, ever call you like an old soul or I felt that there was like I felt that there was kind of like a melancholy in the book and there was a sense of with a lot of the characters like a wistfulness of lost possibilities um that was often there that I certainly am starting to feel at times as I get older but I thought it was ca captured like so so poignantly and I was like she's only 30, the author. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I was just like, you yeah, know, wanted to ask you about that. Is that some, is that, yeah, does that resonate at all? I, I think people have always called me an old soul, but I think a lot of my artistic sensibilities come from being just like the baby in my family. I'm, I'm the youngest of, of, I have two older sisters. I'm the youngest. Uh, my parents are baby boomers. Um, so I've always had this experience of being kind of the child sitting under the table and listening to older people talk around you. Okay, yeah, because I think that really comes through in the storytelling. And as a historian and somebody that's like obsessed with the past, I absolutely, I, I, I really loved that. Um, I wanted to ask you specifically about, am I pronouncing it correctly? Is it Mallard? Mm -hmm how it would be said so yeah the town it made me think of a book that I have read years ago but revisited um over lockdown which is the great um Toni Morrison's paradise and um it made me think of a kind of paradise in reverse because paradise is an all black town as well that's been founded by very dark skin black people who have experienced the cruelty and rejection of light skinned black people in towns like Mallard. So have set up, <laughs> so have set up their own town. So I was like, oh, this is like Mallard's this kind of counter narrative to, to, to Paradise. Um, was Paradise a book that you were thinking about? Um, and could you tell me a little bit about um, maybe the, the history of, of black towns and kind of how you researched that or drew on that? Yeah, I love that comparison. I don't think that that was um, a book that I was necessarily thinking of. And it's not one that's been brought up a lot as I've talked about this book. So that's that's a really cool kind of um, inversion of, of what this book is. Um, I, I really, yeah, the, the idea from the town came from my mother who's from Palmetto, Louisiana. And she remembered, I think her mother telling her about a town like this. And, um, and then in writing the book, I then uh, went and 
did some research and, and found some historical records of similar towns, these very insular Creole communities in Louisiana that were very color conscious um, and existed in a kind of racial reality that I think was di very different than, than lots of other parts of the United States even. Um, this, this idea of being kind of in this third space of race. Um, so I was able to draw on some historical records about it, but a lot of the conjuring it was just imagination and drawing on the stories that my mother told me. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask, um, keeping kind of with Mallard and just coming on from that, I was curious as, um, I, can't, I couldn't, I almost couldn't understand why Again, I'm going to ask you for the pronunciation. Desiree? Desiree? Is that? Desiree. 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 Okay. Why Desiree um, stayed in Mallard for so long with Jude? It's such a difficult place for Jude to grow up. And I just kept feeling like you got to take, you got to move somewhere else with your daughter. Um, was how yeah how did you what were your thoughts of, what were your thoughts about that you know yeah I mean I think um <clears throat> excuse me I think a lot of it was just the sense that um you know Desiree moves back to Mallard and she's kind of at the end of her rope you know she's really has no good options and that's what's kind of forced her back home um and I think that that question that you bring up is one of the tensions that exists kind of within that mother-daughter relationship because Jude very understandably resents the fact that her mother kind of forces her to grow up in this place. Um, Desiree knows how bad it is going to be for her daughter as soon as she arrives. Um, and the idea that she then chooses to stay there is something that Jude has to kind of reckon with as she grows into an adult. But for me, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I wanted to think about that decision in a way, rendering it in a way that was not judgmental towards mm -hmm. Desiree, because again, she's not a woman with a lot of options. You know, she doesn't have a lot of money. Um, she moves back home because she has no a better place to go. Um, so I didn't want to be judgmental toward her, but I also wanted to give space to Jude's uh, anger and also her just general kind of frustration with the fact that this is the decision that her mother made. Yeah, I think that came across really well. It didn't seem judgmental towards her at all, but I think it was something that I think it was something that particularly like um, felt um potent to me because it actually in a way again a reversal it reminded me a little bit of my own childhood in that I spent the first few years of my life in Atlanta um in like a very a very black city with the black side of my family and then my parents brought me back to Ireland when I was four and I had a really really hard time and I was always like why did why, why did you bring me here Right. you know <laughs> but again it was to do with my mom and options and stuff but I could I found that dynamic very interesting and it's had certain res resonances with 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 my own life um okay our central issue that was coming um through to me was um that I found really fascinating was the inhabitants of Mallard um most of well it, it it seems from your descriptions of many of them and um, the physical descriptions of them that probably more of them than just Stella could pass as white. You know, I'm hearing gray eyes and straight red hair and blonde hair and freckles and all of this. And I'm thinking, but culturally, you know, as well as by law, I think it's by, yeah, it's still by law, but culturally it's a, it's a, it's a black town, you know? So it's making me think, what is blackness in the American context? If it's not phenotype, it's something more than that. What, what, what is it? <laughs> so that's um, a really I difficult mean, question. Well, yeah, and I think it's also the question that I was interested in, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I have an aunt who has, you know, pale skin and red hair, um, who's the like full sister of my mother who is a little bit lighter than me. You know, so these are two people who have the same parents, you know. Um, so what is blackness? It's, a, it's entirely the question that I wanted to ask. Uh, I think that that was something that was fascinating. I think, you know, at one point Stella asked, like, well, what makes this person, like, why does this person get to be white and we don't? And that's not a question that has like any type of a logical answer. Um, I think that 
uh, race itself is something that can that is so complex. It's not it can't just be boiled down to uh, biology. It's not you know just what you look like. Um, you know, and in this book, there are elements of people choosing identities, people not choosing identities. Who can choose an identity? Who can't choose an identity? All of those are so complicated. Uh, but but that I as I was working the book, I would tell my family that they would ask what the book was about and. I was like, yeah, my book is, is about, you know, how white people become white and how black people become black. And everybody kind of laughed. Like they didn't, they didn't really take me seriously that that was what I was interested in writing about. But I think that that, that was one of my driving questions is what, what does it boil down to? Because I also kind of reject the idea that there's anything essential about race that, oh, you see another black person and you sense that they are black because you see the blackness, you know, like that, that type of, of belief. Like I also reject that as having any real validity. Uh, but I think that like what unites the people of Mallard is, is I suppose whatever culture is, um, you know, people are tied to this place. They're tied to their community, to their family. They share, uh, you know, a sense of the kind of history of the town. Like all of those things are what tie them to Mallard and what kind of unites them. Um, and maybe that is where whatever their sense of blackness is rooted in. Um, but again, all of these things are really flimsy and permeable and yeah. unstable. And I think that that was entirely the question that I, I wanted to think about as I was writing the book. Yeah, and I thought I thought that was that 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 was so powerful, and I loved as well in Stella's relationship with Loretta. You can see that even though she has convincingly passed into white society, she really misses like black sorority, you know, and is really drawn to Loretta. And I think it's so funny when she slips up by like calling her baby. You know, she uses more kind of like black vernacular, and then it's like. But this woman has been kind of accepted into the into into whiteness, but she still fe she feels this like sense of loss and like longing for something like cultural. I just yeah, I thought that was a really kind of fascinating um, tension throughout 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 the work. Um, I also really loved and actually felt, you know, what I I I actually I finished the book. I finished The Vanishing Happy yesterday. So it's still like very present with me. Um, it actually, like most of my favorite books, made me feel, most books I love, a general thing that I experienced is I actually feel quite sad. It made me feel, it made me feel, made me feel quite sad. And um, I thought the ending um, in terms of where it's left with Stella and it's in, conclusiveness um, in that the past, you know, catches up with her eventually, but there's kind of no resolution in that she's going to continue with her life and she's not, it seems as though she's not really going to have a relationship with her twin sister or with any of the stuff that she's left behind. I thought that was like incredibly well, um, like well written because it was so different to the kind of let's tie up all the loose ends that you often get in narrative and seemed a lot a, a lot more like um like 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 real life so could yeah could we speak it was it was kind of disappointing because you want it to be happy ever after <laughs> like, it's not <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean I think first that just as a reader I, I love books that leave me feeling like the characters are continuing to live their lives once I've mm -hmm. closed the book like I love thinking that these people are out there in the world somewhere and the story has not ended just because yes. I've, I've finished reading it. Um, so I think that's one thing, that's just how I'm kind of oriented as a reader. So it's how I'm oriented as a writer. But I also think that there is, um, to me, it felt, I knew that the, like the obvious kind of conclusion for the story is like, oh, all the, you gather all the characters again, you know, everyone has come together at the end for like a wedding or something, you know, whatever. You kind of gather everybody and there is some type of resolution that's created there. Uh, but that just didn't seem to, to uh, that just didn't seem to make any type of emotional sense to me because of who these characters are. Um, because of the fact that when I thought about Stella, I'm like, this is a woman who has lived most of her life as a white person. Like that is, where she has spent the majority of her adult life. Um, and that is the life that is real to her at this point. Uh, you know, that is the life that she has truly committed to and really um, and really kind of found herself in for, for most of her life. 
Um, so, so I loved the idea of, of seeing Stella's life just continue in this way. Um, even if that does, uh, dissatisfy you because you want to see the twins kind of get back together. Um, to me, I didn't see a way in which that made sense for them mm -hmm. because there was so much hurt. There was so much betrayal. There was so much pain and all this time that had gone by. So the idea that they would just kind of, you know, be, uh, yeah, be happy sisters together again. You know, these are women who separate when they're like 16, 17 years old. And now all of these years have passed. Um, they've both become these two very different people in the time they've been apart. And to me, it made mo more emotional sense to kind of see them living their separate lives and to see these families kind of splinter and go off into these directions that you know, like they're never, those family lines are never coming back together again, really. Like they're going off in their separate ways. There's something about that that I agree is sad, but it also to me made the most emotional sense for the story. Yeah, com completely. And I think one of the things that it, it, that it achieves was I really felt the the um, the violence of race, the violence of um, the invention and the enforcement of racial categories, like what that has done, like even beyond the more explicit um, uh, incidents like the lynching of their father, just the way it has, you know, separated and separated people and torn families apart and just created all of this emotional turmoil on a far, on, on a far greater scale beyond just the relationship between these two sisters. And I think um, the, the, uh, uh, what's the word? Um, when something is a little version of a bigger thing, my brain is yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, <laughs> my blanking too. <laughs> but yeah, I think that was that that the the, the violence of race and racial categories. Yeah. I think was was really well um, articulated and powerfully expressed. Um, do I have time for another question? Okay, fantastic. Um, I wanted to ask as well about the character of Reese and the um, kind of. I guess the points that were being made or the parallels um, and differences that um, kind of come up with what I had expected from the book, which was this idea of racial passing, but then also something that I didn't know was gonna be in there was like the, the trans character and the idea around how I guess people can have different identities within one lifetime not just in terms of race, which I had anticipated, but also in terms of uh, in terms of gender. So, what was the kind of decision making process between uh, within including that that story as well? Yeah, Reese was just a character that I loved, and um, I think for me, what was really interesting about him is that uh, you know he is a character who reinvents himself, um, which is like Stella does. Um, but really, to me, he became most interesting because he was his story was really a counterpoint to Stella in a lot of ways. Um, you know, Reese is a character who experiences this physical change, but it's it's on a journey towards affirmation. It's towards becoming himself. Um, really, when he physically changes, that is the point in which he becomes himself. Uh, Stella's journey is the complete opposite. She doesn't change physically at all, really. Um, she doesn't even assume a new name, but she becomes somebody who is completely different than who she was. She transforms like mentally and emotionally and psychologically um, in a way while she does not transform physically. Mm -hmm. So to me, those stories were really interesting because they were contrasting each other in some, um, in some thought provoking ways from as I was thinking about them. Um, and I think I also just love Reese's journey because I think it adds another dimension to this, this question of what the costs of, of changing are, um, because he is somebody who, who loses his family in the way that Stella loses her family, um, but he also finds liberation. And uh, I don't know that Stella finds that. Um, mm. So I think that it, it kind of complicates. I think there is a, a, when you are first just seeing what Stella does, it, it can be easy to, it can be easy to judge her, but also just to think that um, somebody going on this journey of reinvention is only going to be painful. Um, and I think that Reese experiences pain, but he also experiences liberation. And I liked that that complicated um, that journey of what it means to really become somebody different or, or become more of yourself in the case of Reese. 
Yeah, oh, awesome answer. And actually kind of uh, building on from that, I also felt that um, the kind of contrast between Kennedy and Jude was really interesting in terms of Jude, you no know, Kennedy for all her seeming privilege in many different ways, actually by the end of the book seems, you know, like, well, not even just at the end, but just seems far more of like a lost kind of character. It, she doesn't, she doesn't seem like her life is better than Jude's. In fact, Jude in her relationship with Reese and in her kind of like rootedness in like her community and her family and stuff actually seems like the person who, whose life seems like, seems better essentially. Was that something that was um, in, intentional or that you even would agree with? Um, I, I, uh, I don't know that it was intentional, um, but I did want to think about, you know, I wanted Jude to have, um, I wanted her to have some moments of triumph, I think, because she has such a rough time growing up. So I knew that I wanted to have some of those moments of triumph and to see her out in the world, um, falling in love and achieving her goals, um, and doing those types of things. Um, but I think between Jude and Kennedy there, to me, one of the big differences between the two of them, obviously there are so many differences between the two of them and their personalities and their upbringings. Um, but I think that Jude knows herself and Kennedy does not, you know, she has no way of knowing herself because the story that she has been told about herself and her family has been um, one that's been constructed. So I think that that is like this real deficit. And, and as you said, Kennedy is born into so much immense privilege but she has this extreme deficit of, of what it means to know and understand herself. And that's something that she then has to kind of spend her life as an adult chasing after. Um, and that's something that I think uh, takes a toll um, in a way that Jude does not experience that in the same way. Mm -hmm. It was also making me think um, how, many, how many Kennedys <laughs> there must be. Um, there must be so many white people in America who are secretly black not secretly black oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? and it was no, also, for sure <laughs> it absolutely was, <laughs> it was making me think as well um I was recently reading about the difference in how racial classifications kind of work in Brazil and um this article was saying that in Brazil your race is based on how you look so basically I think because all Brazilians basically something like 98 percent of Brazilians, 96 percent of Brazilians, some really high percentage have African ancestry. Mm -hmm. So they're not doing the one drop rule. <laughs> they're right, like, yeah. OK, it's based on how you look. Whereas in America, as is so um, kind of powerfully demonstrated in The Vanishing Half, it's actually based on on your on, on your on your ancestry, you know, however much that is visible or not in your appearance. Do you think that's something that is changing? in the States? Uh, I mean, I think that we have a much more expansive language for, for like multiculturalism or multiracialism. Um, I think for me, what was so interesting and in thinking about a place like Mallard is because again, this is existing during the era of Jim Crow that is truly a binary of color mm -hmm. versus white. You know, mm -hmm. there was not a lot of space there for this in between. Now I think we have a larger space and understanding in our language of that, you know, the idea of being purely black or purely white, you know, I think we have a sense that that's not true of anybody. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that is a thing that has changed. But I think, again, this, this question of what makes you a certain race, is it how other people perceive you? Is it how you perceive yourself? Is it how you identify? What if you don't know that this is your racial background? Is it if you get a DNA test? You know, all of these things, I think, again, are so complicated. Uh, so I, I think for me writing the book, the challenge, the way the book personally challenged me, I think was to, again, like force me to see the nuances um, of identity and in a way that I think you may know intellectually, but still when you see someone walking down the street, you make like a, you know, this knee jerk assumption or knee jerk read of, of gender and race, to be honest, like you're making these, these kind of knee jerk uh, mm -hmm. reactions and reads sometimes, but I think writing this book forced me to, to challenge myself even in that way that 
you know, how, like, I don't know how somebody else identifies racially. I'm just making an assumption of how I am reading them. Mm -hmm. That may or may not be true. (laughs) Uh, But I think that all of that is, again, much more complicated in forcing myself to take a step back and not try to make those types of judgments of, of what I think somebody's race or gender or whatever is. Um, I think that the book has forced me to to slow down and, and challenge myself when I'm making those nature kind of reads. Oh wow! I love that um, that your own writing has changed your. Um, well, that totally that totally makes sense. But you know, it, it's it's come from you. Obviously, you're the creator of it. But then it's also like challenging you or allowing you to think differently about something than you did than you did previously. I really like that relationship. Yeah, I mean, I took, I, like, I took a class in college. I remember the professor said, like the first three things that we read about strangers are race, gender, and age. And none of those are things that we have a way of knowing. Like you can tell, like, is this person a child or are they an adult? Like you can kind of make that type of judgment. Um, but like, you don't know somebody's gender, you don't know their race. Uh, but those are the things that we just immediately as humans kind of read about people. Um, so I think just allowing for the fact that I don't like reminding myself that you don't know and, um, and just allowing myself to sit in the instability of that and to sit in the sometimes discomfort of that, but also just reminding myself that that is true. That has always been true of what it means to be alive. Um, and if you think, you know, you are just assuming, um, I think that that's a gen- like a general, a general good thing to remind yourself about anything, but it's something I think writing this book has reminded me for sure. I think that's so brilliant. I love that. I, I remember studying, um, doing my master's and doing a course on childhood and finding out that, so, okay, so I, I knew about race and gender, um, but finding out childhood was a construction. And before like the 1800s, they hadn't even seen younger people as children in the way we understand today. I was like, oh my God. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. You know, (laughs) these assumptions that we have about um, uh, kind of foundational ideas are often quite recent inventions and socially engineered. Absolutely. Uh, I'm aware of time and opening up to um, the others. So should we do that now? Great. Thank you so much, Emma. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Britt. Um, I have no doubt, and judging by the the comments and the questions coming in, the audience could listen to you two chatting away for quite some time. (laughs) I have some fantastic questions in here. Um, From John Skeffington, uh, for you, Britt, he asks, had you decided that the twins would be female before writing? How different would the story have been if the twins had been male or male and female, one male, one female. Ooh, that's a kind of an interesting question. I had not no, thought I about so. that. Um, yeah, I, I immediately knew that they would be women. Um, I had not really thought about that of one being a man and one being a woman. That's interesting. Um, I think, yeah, I, I mean, I think one, I, I think I'm just generally, again, as a writer, I'm mostly am writing about women. Um, so I, I don't think it ever occurred to me that these would be men. Um, but that aside, I think that there, I have kind of a half baked idea about this and I'm sure somebody much smarter than myself has written about this. Uh, but I, but I just sort of anecdotally noticed how a lot of our really iconic stories about passing, um, often involve women. Um, I, you know, I think something like Nell Larson's passing, imitation of life, um, and even the kind of new iteration of these figures with, you know, the Rachel Dolezal of it all. Um, these these um, people who keep uh, cropping up who are passing for black or, or something else, they are also women. Um, so I think there's something, um, and that's not to say that the only people who pass are women. That's like indisputably a thing that is not true. Um, but I think that narratively there is a fascination with women making these decisions. Uh, and one thought that I have about it is just that because passing is is such an act of self-determination that there's something about that, that's very transgressive if you're a woman. You know, if I think about this story with these being men, the idea of men kind of setting out to create a life for themselves apart from community and family is not as transgressive, really. It's not as notable that a man might do that. You know, for mm-hmm. Stella as a man to be, I'm going to leave my family behind and marry somebody and go to the other side of the country, 
you know, that's kind of an old hat narrative for a man to do, but for her to be a woman to do that is actually, um, makes people a lot more uncomfortable. Um, and I think also it speaks to this, this question of children, which Stella has this anxiety of, oh, what's my child going to be like? Is my child going to be dark? Um, and if Stella were a man, you could simply be like, that's not my kid. <laughs> you know, you could disown a dark child if you're a man who's passing, but if you are a woman who's passing and you have a kid, um, you know, that is going to potentially be a problem for you. So I think that there are those connections and maybe just the cultural ties that we associate with women and family and community that passing is something that severs those ties completely in the most dramatic way you can sever them. And that that's one of the reasons why we have a fascination with, with women who pass. Um, so that's like a thought I have about it. But I, I think that for me, um, the stakes felt so much higher with these characters being women. Um, and, uh, and I think just generally I'm more interested in the lives of women. So I think that's, that's why they were always female twins. That's very insightful for us, actually, Britt, in, in understanding it. And I can see your point about, you know, the maternal instinct there that they think ahead already to the children and what, what you know, what will I do? Um, I have another question here that is more about your, your writing approach, Britt. Um, and it's from Anne. And she asks, how did you approach writing this? Did you plot it with various themes or how did you build on the historical research? Did you research beforehand? How, how, did, it, how did it come about? Um, yes, I, research, I researched uh, before. Um, I read some books about racial passing um, and particularly the context of race in Louisiana and those particularities there. Um, so that was what I did before. Um, I don't really outline. I kind of just go for it once I start writing, um, for better or for worse. Uh, so I knew that I wanted to start with Desiree returning to Mallard with her daughter and that causing a big stir. Um, I knew that was where I wanted to start. I had no idea where I wanted to go or where I wanted to end. I didn't know what was, what was going to be happening with Stella. I didn't know any of that as I was writing. Um, so I really just started with Desiree returning and then just tried to find my way from there, really. Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> um, we're coming to the end of it now. I, I don't have time for too many more questions. I have um, one question in here. Bear with me until I, I find it again. And it's for... Um, oh, excuse me. I've, I'm losing it. Um, you mentioned earlier, there's one question here about, and it, it's mentioning about how you see what is black, what is race. And the question is, is, is for both of you, uh, but Emma, I would, I'd like to bring you in here. When you talk um, about what defines race, be it color, be it how you look, be it your facial features, how you speak, your hair. Emma, obviously for you, hair is, a huge issue it's a huge part of who being black is it's also comes across as something that very much and in your childhood in Ireland defined you as being very different whilst your skin may have been lighter um your hair just was a giveaway wasn't it <laughs> I mean, I don't think it was just my hair. It's like my entire everything looked like nobody around me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but hair, you mentioned even in, in your book, Emma, um, Don't Touch My Hair, that there was a, there's an actual um, scale of, of how um, black you are by your hair. There is actual um, a table that defines whether you fall into category one, two, three or four, how curly your hair is or... Oh yeah, so I I mean I find those those ca those categorizations like any kind of racial taxonomies like <laughs> problematic to say the least. But yeah, in the like natural hair community, there are different like yeah categorizations of hair, and I kind of in don't touch my hair draw on the historical antecedents of that. You know, with like this guy called Eugene Fisher who had this hair gauge that he he's a, he was a Nazi scientist who would but he was based in a Namibia before he went back to Germany and he, he created this hair gauge which he would use to determine the race of mixed people that were um that had a German father and a and a Namibian or an African mother and he'd kind of like categorize them based on their on their hair textures whether they were kind of black or not or what their what their racial identity was and he had this kind of uh uh 
system of mass sterilization of her hereditarily unfit people. But one of the ways of doing his class, his Nazi classification was, um, was hair texture. Yeah. So in the history of categorizing people in terms of race, um, hair has been, you know, a, a um, has been one of those kind of dominant dominant features. You have the pencil test in South Africa. Uh, when I was researching Don't Touch My Hair um, as well, we, I think people are, I, actually, I don't know, but maybe some people have heard of like the paper bag tests where in like black communities, I guess in towns like Mallard, there would be, um, determining whether or not you could join certain sororities or certain churches was your for black people was your skin light enough was it lighter than a than a brown paper bag but when i was researching the book there was also these um comb tests like so to join certain groups or become a member of a congregation of certain churches um you had to have a certain texture of hair and there was if if the comb wouldn't easily pass through your hair then you weren't deemed a suitable type of black person to 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 become a member of one of those uh, organizations. So yeah, hair was used to determine race. It's not just complexion. Yeah, it's it's remarkable when you when you when you think of it. Um, I have one last one final question. Um, sadly, we see a lot of nationalist sentiment increasing with negative results across the globe. Um, Ireland um, itself, how do you think in Ireland that we can avoid heading down that road of negative nationalism? When you were growing up here, Emma, we weren't a multicultural, multiracial country to live in. We are now, much more so, um, but we're still quite young in that. How can Ireland define its own path in setting an inspiration, inspiring example of what a prosperous, inclusive, dynamic society can look like as we have done recently being the first to legalize same-sex marriage, and as we are now proposing to criminalize the publication of revenge porn on social media. Wow, that's, that's, that's a fantastic question. What can Ireland do? Legislation, integration, education, what is it do you think um, that we can do in Ireland to avoid heading down a negative nationalist path? Perhaps, Brish, you might come in there. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I feel like I'm speaking from, you know, the like harrowing future, the ghost of, of Christmas future. That's just don't, don't do what the United States did. Um, um, you know, I think it's hard. It's hard to say. I think one of the things that has really struck me about what's happening here is just, it feels like we are living in separate realities. You know, it feels like there is one version of the country where Joe Biden has been elected president and the coronavirus has killed, you know, over 200,000 people. And then there's another version of the country where Donald Trump is going to hang on and serve another term and COVID is a hoax. And that is where we are. And it's what type of, you know, what version of reality are you in? That is what you are experiencing. And I, you know, I think a lot of it comes from misinformation. A lot of it is people you know, social media, people not critically reading and, and people just consuming the media that is in whatever version of reality you're choosing to live in. Um, but to me, that is one of the scariest things because it feels like that genie has been let out of the bottle and it does not matter what the election results are. You know, in January, we are still going to be living in two different realities. You know, there's going to be another, there's going to be an earth two where Donald Trump is the rightful president and COVID doesn't exist and that's going to still happen. Um, so to me, that is the, the harrowing, like, potential future of any country, of, of um, the country becoming so polarized and uh, just people relying so deeply on whatever version of reality that they see fit, that the fact that, you know, hundreds of thousands of people have died, people still resisting that as any type of fact. Um, that, to me, is, is what... Um, is what any country should should try their best to avoid, and I don't. I have no recommendation of how. I'm just I'm just telling you how terrible it is. So, um, so I hope that I hope that everybody um, is able to avoid that that future. Great, thank you so much. Um, thank you to both of you. Um, that was a, a wonderful discussion. 
Um, I'm sorry to those of you who are watching. I can't, um, we just don't have any time for any more questions. And there are so many of them for both of you. Um, it's been an honor to speak and listen to you this evening. Um, both books are absolutely remarkable and they're important books that we should all read. Fantastic for an understanding of what race is and what the complexities of race are. Um, Emma, we'll be looking forward to your book in March, What White People Do Next. And <laughs> um, we'll be looking, we'll certainly be looking forward to um, your next, next work. Um, thank you both so much for joining us this evening. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, and we were deep, from all the team at Dingle Lit, we are deeply grateful for you being here. Thank you so much. Thank and you. now I would like to just thank again, all of you for watching, for joining in tonight. Absolutely amazing turnout. And I have no doubt at all that um, Emma and Britt are, are going to be two authors that we're going to be talking about for some time into the future. Um, in the meantime, uh, coming up at 7 p.m., we have the lovely John Creedon with our very own Faro Multin, Irachis Irishor and Melina, Sean McIntyhig. So, Bemi the Sulgamur Leshin. Do join in for John Creedon speaking with Sean McIntyhig um, at 7 p.m. Mila Buechus, August Longfell.